I'm on? J. Dale. J. Dale. Yeah. J. Dale. Hines. She, she well, hello to all. We have a crowd on here. Hey, Troy, give me a quick uh, one line uh, synopsis of the Bible conference up at Jack's Church. How are you? We've got, we've got Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee. Tennessee twice. Alabama. Represented. Fantastic fellowship, great preaching, gained three pounds. It was a great success then, wasn't it? <laughs> Turn, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And if you who, um, I've got a question here I'm going to talk about unless one of you here in the audience has a question or one of you online has a question. No, I got it right here. I didn't have anything else to do, Chuck, so I just, I joke. All right, since I see no questions come pouring in, I want you to notice 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, because of a question about how do you explain or, how, or, or explain the, the fear of God. Notice in uh, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, um, the fear of God, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and it also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, both the same book, Proverbs, both verses are there. So the, the word fear uh, 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 is not the same word as... Um, as panic-stricken, it is not the same word as uh, uh, cowering. Uh, the word fear has to do with a reverence and awe of that which is above you. That is not 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 simply uh, over your head, but above you in the sense that the Lord David said, "the the ways of the Lord are too wonderful for me." Well, um, you find the same word wonderful used by John about something in the book of Revelation that he saw was a bad thing. So the word wonderful is wonder-filled in both cases. It is filled with wonder because you do not understand it. You know, you say, well, I wonder about that sometimes. And what you mean is you don't understand it. Well, wonder-filled puts you in an awestruck position. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know what I can say about that. I don't know what I can I don't know how I can come up to that. I'm always underneath that. And that's the kind of terminology that the word fear is uh, in both the Old Testament and the New when it comes to the Lord. Now, there's some exceptions to that where... Um, uh, one, of the, one of the minor prophets says, fear God and keep his commandments. Well, that has to do with fearing the retribution of God. And that has to do with living under the law. But when Paul says to perfect holiness in the fear of God, holiness has to do with, uh, with that which is in your life. Um, the best way to say this is that which is in your life is not unholy. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God has everything to do with standing in awe of Him and what is His holiness. The Bible says that He dwells in holiness. In other words, His presence, uh, which is far above all heavens, where Christ is seated at His right hand, and so forth, then to, uh, to uh, see uh, perfecting holiness is to perfect in your mind to perfect that which is only 
perfectly set aside as belonging to him. You know, when you were young, if you were in an organized uh, church of any kind, you sang a song. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Um, it's lost the, the next line. But the, not of time alone, but, all, but, but for all eternity. Thank you. And, and so those words are describing perfecting holiness. We're told to do that. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Hmm. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting is a verb, or garen, but it's a verb. Hence, and the whole point is, there is a way that we can perfect holiness. If there wasn't a way that we could perfect holiness, Paul wouldn't have said that. So he starts with, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The word all is a real tripper right there. Hard to do that, isn't it? But you'll also notice, he says, let us cleanse our, ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The one thing I believe wholeheartedly is that the student of the Lord does that by the, by the word of the Lord, not by condemnational preaching. You know what? If you're doing something wrong by the word of God that would keep you from perfecting holiness in the fear of God, Shall a little old preacher like me make you afraid? I doubt it. If I brought a fear upon you, you might, uh, about this, about you doing something, and if I brought some fear upon you by some strong condemnation, would it not be so that you would think that I would need to know when you got rid of that? None of my business. It's between you and the Lord. In the fear of God means that you understand His presence. About 35 times in your Bible, of the people who belong to the Lord, the Bible says he knows your thoughts. I don't know your thoughts. I just, I, I, sometimes I get some scripture attachment, and especially in irony form, comes to me by seeing a scene in, in and out of a movie that depicts someone's foolishness toward God. I was watching some stupid thing to fill 20 minutes yesterday and this little teenage girl's done a bunch of stuff that's wrong and so she goes into a, a Protestant church and st went in and sat down at the, at the preacher to, to tell him all the things wrong and, and he says, you know, I'll help you any way I can and she looks at the picture and sees the, the girl that she did that it's against, it's her, it's his daughter. So she got up and ran out of the church and she goes into the Catholic church even though she's not a Catholic, goes into the confessional booth and thinks to herself, this is the right place to do it. So she sits down and starts rattling off, you know, just rattles off all this stuff. And she says, she stops and she says, aren't you supposed to respond some way, say 10 Hail Marys or whatever? And she looks over there, there's nobody there. I thought to myself, what a great picture that is. There's nobody there. There isn't any point in confessing your sins to somebody. There's no fear of Jerry before their eyes. I don't think that'll work. So the fear of God is to stand in awe of him about what he is and how he is in his holiness because you're called upon to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Now I want you to look at the fear of God in the scripture some. Look a bit back at Genesis chapter 20. This is about Abraham. And it's about that thing everybody thinks he ought to be condemned about. I don't, but everybody else does. <clears throat> Verse 1, chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. 
And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, uh, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? I don't know that nation, so I don't know whether that was a, a true statement or a, 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 a hope on Abimelech's part. But he, verse 5, said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she even herself, she herself said he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us, and what have I offended thee, uh, that thou hast brought on me and, my, and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness, which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he's my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him, Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the rooms of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Well, well, well. Number one, Abraham didn't lie. She was his sister. Number two, Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. Well, as it turned out, because God was a friend of Abraham's, Abraham was a friend of God's, and because God saw that Abraham had both the fear of God himself and thought there was no fear of God in this place, God, by his intervention, justified the whole action. A lot of people don't like that about Abraham. They want Abraham to have made a mistake there. Well, the Lord never rebuked him. Therefore, I don't believe you and I should. I think we should let the Lord handle that because Abraham did fear the Lord and was a, a friend to him and on and on all the, all the days and whatever. Uh, now, the fear of God that Abraham was looking for was not the fear of God as in 2 Corinthians 7. It was if, as if there would be or will there be a retribution um, upon this land that Abraham was in. And when the Lord handled it in the manner in which he handled it, he both restored uh, Abraham and he restored, excuse me, Chuck, stay open. I have to talk to this every now and then, don't you? Because of the way God restored things, both to Abimelech, and Abimelech laid these gifts upon Abraham, and, and uh, the Lord said to Abimelech, Abraham will pray for you. Then the Lord used it as an opportunity to show the world, Abimelech being representing the world, who his man was. Remember the blessing? I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, 
and that these shall all families of the earth be blessed, if Abimelech had taken his wife, it would have been a curse upon Abimelech, and God showed Abimelech through the use of Abraham whom he had chosen, how he had chosen him, and, Abim and Abraham prayed for him, and on and on. I don't know if I can answer all of that any other way about why did he say, I didn't think the fear of God was in this land. I bet you when he left there, he understood the fear of God was in the land. And so the Lord does that. Now notice, uh, second... Samuel, yeah, 2 Samuel 23. Second Samuel 23, verse 1. This is a great principle. The Lord uses this principle from Adam forward, even today. <clears throat> now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake unto me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And there's that all. That's not the cowering, scaredy cat approach. That is understanding the awesomeness of God as opposed to the inability of man to be like him. That's it, right there. That's how, that's how the fear of God, as Paul used it in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, concerning us, that's how this is uh, posed to the world. And he said, again, they that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. To not rule in the fear of God is to think your almighty turn to Daniel Chapter 4, Daniel, chapter 4, here's Nebuchadnezzar ruling over the people of God, therefore coming under the tutelage, if you will, kind of a light word to use, of God, they that ruleth over men. Let's rule in the fear of God. Notice verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. Now, he gets afraid of this dream he has. And Daniel tells him about the dream. And he says in verse uh, 29, At the end of twelve months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of that Babylon, and the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the of the kingdom of by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. And the next seven years he was as an animal. He was mad and his hair grew so long that it turned like birds' feathers and his nails grew so long that they were like eagles' claws or birds' claws and on and on it goes. He ate the grass of the field when the time of the end of the, of the prophecy in the dream was over with, he got his mind back. Look at verse 34. And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever. 
whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and by the way, that's very similar to the word holiness, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. In other words, the prime example of how to learn why you should fear the Lord is what the Lord did to Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord taught Nebuchadnezzar who he was. On more than one occasion, but in this case it took seven years. The Lord taught him. Now the Lord has given all this, us all this great and precious word. We who have all the word of God in a dispensation in which God Almighty has granted us everything by his grace and nothing according to our works. He says unto us, with all of his word intact, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Should we take it lightly? Or should we take it seriously? Now, if you will, look in uh, uh, Romans. Uh, no, not Romans. Uh, uh, look in Psalm 36. Psalm 36. Verse 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. The wicked knows no reason to fear God. In his heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Now look, if you will, in Romans chapter 3, how Paul uses that. Romans 3. In Romans 3, verse 10. Paul writes and begins to use several verses of Old Testament scripture here. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way, they're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Accounting, based upon Psalm 36, accounting that all, as in 9, 10, 11, 12, that all are, be, are wicked before the Lord, there is no fear of God before their eyes. In other words, as we look out at our world, and in, and in a, a lost condition, in an unsaved condition, we look out at the world, and we have no fear of God before our eyes. In other words, we might lie down at night and remembrance of having heard some scripture or some Bible story about the retribution of God upon the earth or people upon the earth, and we might feel the fear of God in a convicting manner against what we were earlier the day, another day, when we were so bold as to have no fear of God before our eyes. But without the scripture, there would be no way of any convicting power come toward us. 
So we hear the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and we fear dying without some form of salvation, and so we hunt some kind of relief. One of the verses in Romans chapter 3 says, there is none that seeketh after God. And people say, well, I believe in, I believe I sought after the Lord. No, you didn't. You thought sought after the Lord because somebody told you about the Lord. What you're seeking was some form of relief. You're looking for some form of peace you didn't have. And therefore someone told you about the Lord and you would claim that you sought after the Lord. And in fact, sometimes religion even teaches that you're seeking the Lord at an old-fashioned altar or some terminology such as that. And that's not the case. If you look at the front of a church building, and I, I've been in lots of revivals where the preacher would stand like I'm standing right now, and he would point to this altar bench there, and he'd say, why don't you come? Why don't you come? What for? Well, among other things, a fair show in the flesh, Galatians chapter 6. Also, among other things, it's lots easier to count them by going one, two, three, four. Instead of looking at the crowd and wondering whether or not anybody made a move for the Lord. You see, the whole point is that you could be emotionally drawn to what looks like the Lord when that Lord's, the Lord's not at that altar. The Lord's hung on the cross as an altar. Not at a bench in front of a church service somewhere. They didn't have bench altars in the synagogues and temples of the 1500 year uh, rule of the law of God of, over the nation of Israel. Jerry, yes. Would you compare what you said to the verse that says, Seek you the Lord while he may be found? How that was, uh, that was a great verse. Seek you the Lord while he may be found was spoken by David unto the people of God, not to lost people. Another reason for going to the altar at the front of the church is maybe if I go, this service will end. <laughs> That's true. Because time, 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 time to get to lose, man. Well, and, I mean, well, after the and, 30th verse, and, just and, as I am. In I revival meetings, somebody in the group of teenagers I used to stand with in revival meetings would say, you going to the altar tonight? No. <laughs> well, you ought to. I haven't had supper yet. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless... One more thing about this and then we'll move on. Look in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. And this is a specific um, subject matter being covered, but it fits what we're talking about. <coughs> Notice verse 20. giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Hmm. Well, it goes on to be a comparison to a man and a woman, a wife and a husband, and it compares that to Christ presenting unto himself a perfect church. And so it says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God when it's still talking about, when the context is still the whole church. Chapter 5, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. And in, 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 and in fact, in verse, uh, uh, verse 15, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and on and on. Speaking to yourselves, verse 19, and in other words, it's the group. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God is to submit yourselves one to another in this fellowship and this seeking the Lord and the seeking the will of the Lord for your lives to submit yourselves one to another in the sense that other people stand in the same awe and fear of the Lord as you do. If they don't, they're probably not real good about fellowship with you. If they don't. So, I don't know if that helps Chuck or is that, okay, has it got any uh, benefit, whatever. Um, I have a question from the internet. Turn to Mark chapter 8.
Mark chapter 8. We need to start back about verse 14. The question is, why would it seem to take Christ two tries to heal this blind, uh, this blind man? So we'll get to that. We just need to check this context because of what the Lord is, I should say as much as what, but who the Lord is teaching here. Verse 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. Now, I'm not trying to put, say that, that, that these disciples here were, uh, were not very bright. That's not what my point is when I'm fixing to say this. They weren't paying attention. Mark, Matthew 16 does this similar thing and, and goes on to explain that it was the leaven, uh, 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 that the bad doctrine he was talking about, the doctrine of the Pharisees and so forth. Notice how he hand, answers it here, <coughs> verse 17. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason you because you have no bread? Perceive you not yet, neither understand? Have you your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see you not? And having ears, hear you not? And do you not remember? When I break the five loaves among the five among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven uh, among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? They said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not uh, that ye do not understand? And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands against, uh, again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns and so forth. Now, the question is not, in my mind, the question is not, did it take Christ two tries? The question, in my mind, is what did he teach the disciples? In the context of it all, the problem was the, Pharise the uh, uh, leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod was thought to be something they needed physically. So he takes this guy out of the town, away from the town's people, you would think, is what he meant there, led him out of the town. And he made it so that he could see uh, men uh, as trees walking. In other words, it, the implication is it's not distinguishable. I think he just showed the apostles something. He showed the apostles that there's a way to distinguish things and then there's a way not to. There's a reason to distinguish things and there's a reason not to. There's a reason why the twelve apostles were taught, or the disciples, were taught this. It's not so much about the blind man. He healed the blind man and that wouldn't have been a fault of his that he couldn't heal him on one try. It's more along the lines of what is the Lord teaching. Well, let me tell you something about that. When you watch the Lord do something, watch Him do it. He does it well. But men not, may not see it well. Men may not have it clear in their mind. For instance, in a situation where a married couple that I know of, they um, split, got a divorce. The man didn't want the divorce, began to really regret it, 
and in searching for a way to fix things, discovered that he was lost. He just discovered that he needed a savior. Well, he trusted Christ as his savior. He went back to his wife and reasoned with her over the word of the Lord that he was not the same one that they'd had disagreement that where they had had their disagreements he was not the same man so they remarried but he was the same man I don't really doubt that he got saved and praise the Lord for his salvation but he would be like these disciples following Jesus around not remembering the miracles bringing bread into the thought that the Lord laid upon them about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod thinking he was talking about something to eat when he had made food from nothing before them twice before and fed thousands in the doing of it so he, said, he touches this man's eyes and says, How's that work? And he says, Well, I see men as trees walking. And the Lord said, In effect, to the disciples, the Lord said, Wow, he's like you guys. He can't see. Though I've touched him, he can't see. So he touched him again. And he saw clearly. What's that tell the apostles? Bring your doubts to the Lord. You have every reason to bring him to him. You have no reason whatsoever to stay back from him. What's it tell you? He said, let your request be made known unto God. Philippians chapter 4. Same kind of object lesson as the blind man. Why would you doubt him? I don't know what I would say to that couple that I just mentioned, but if I was having a conversation with them, I think I would say to them, why don't you take this to the Lord? Why don't you straighten this out with the Lord? And I know about physical and, and um, uh, mental abuse and, and uh, all that sort of thing. But here they are, two saved people. Shall they just not understand? It probably is going to be that way. It probably is. Not that I know, have no idea, can't read ahead of time. But it probably is. Why would that be? Say, so, well, you said he, but he wasn't really changed. I didn't say he wasn't changed. I said he was still the same man. Are you not the same man or same woman that you were before you were saved? Yes, you are. What's the difference? The Lord in your life is the difference. And so it was with the Lord and the apostles and the blind man. Scott, I think that's the answer to that. I don't think it was a question of whether or not Jesus could heal him with one touch. I think it was like, the, I think he used it to show the disciples something. So uh, if that's not what Seems right to you. I uh, apologize for that. But nevertheless. Anybody else got a question? Nobody? Do you all understand that this has been a long day? I can quit right now. <laughs> did have to eat a lot. Yeah, well, I didn't. And uh, i tell you something. It was great fun to just go sit down. And I was shocked that Barbara fixed me a plate. And two or three people laughed and said, Barbara fixed your plate because she was afraid you'd go in there and eat all that stuff. And, I, and I, I didn't know whether or not that was on her mind or not. But I said to her, you know, you didn't need to do this. I, that, that would not have bothered me. What was in there wouldn't have bothered me. And she said, no, that wasn't why I did it. I did it because I was afraid by the time you got through the line, there wouldn't be anything left that you could eat. 
And I think that was very sweet of her that she did that. She brought me the, the stuff that she knew was uh, low fat, low calories. By the way, did y'all eat any of the beans? Any what? The beans? It was like a pot of beans? Yes. Yes, they were the good. The yeah, yeah. They were good. Yeah. Who, who made those? Barbara. Very low calorie. Don't think you not you can't like that food. That's very good food. <laughs> she she didn't use any of that hog fat. No. Hog fat. The hog jowl she left out this time around. <laughs> uh, those of you on the internet, you did miss a grand day here. Uh, you should have been here, and especially some names I see that are close enough to be here. Why weren't you here, Sean? And on and on. Uh, you would have loved being here today. It was a good which, crowd. Which Sean is that? Austin? Perkins. Mm-hmm. Austin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he has a question. Sean says, what is the significance of the if in verse Colossians 1.23 at the beginning? It's very, near, very closely associated with Ephesians. Go to Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. And first, the, the verse that he has a question about Look in Colossians chapter 1, first of all. We'll read that context. <coughs> and we'll start with the reference to Jesus Christ in verse uh, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now watch carefully these next four verses. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereby Paul am made a minister, and so forth. So, Sean's question is the significance of the word if. Well, it's significant, very significant, because the process that the Lord is, is uh, um, uh, fulfilling here is, last part of verse 22, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in, in his sight. For you to be holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight would mean that all of your work was perfectly done, which is conditional upon if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. He does not say that if you uh, fail to continue in the faith grounded and settled and you are moved away from the hope of the gospel, that therefore you are lost. He doesn't say that because he has already said you have the forgiveness of sins. Uh, he has already reconciled you unto himself and even though you're alienated and enemies because of what you were in the body of his flesh through death, he has made it possible to present you holy and unblameable, and that's where the if comes in. So now for comparison's sake, uh, if you want to hold on there, I've got another thought there in Colossians 1 and go to Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he, God Almighty, hath chosen us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well now, that, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love carries the same if. It's just not in the passage. But notice in the same context... Look in verse 12 and 13, that we should be the praise of his glory first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And then verse 11, in whom also we've obtained an inheritance. So the people in Ephesians 1 are saved and secure. The, Ephesians, the people in Colossians 1 are saved and secure. And yet to be holy and without blame and un... What was the word? Unreprovable in his sight has got an if on it. And that has to do with what we do in our flesh. Look back in Colossians and look in Colossians chapter 2. <laughs> ah, John's not available. He's in California instead of in Austin. Sorry about that. And um, um, Pam, Pamela Johnson said she could smell that. I guess she's talking about the uh, bean soup. She could smell it in her house, from my house. Oh, yeah. Sean, it's been pointed out here that all men are liars. Are we really supposed to believe you're in California? Colossians 2, verse um, 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And Sean, I hate to tell you this, but if you're in California, beware, boy. Beware. You're in California now. <laughs> for in him in Christ uh, by the way there's godly people in California sorry Californians for in him Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you're complete in him you see it doesn't say you're complete in him if you continue in the faith grounded and settled it doesn't say you're complete in him and you ought to be without blame before him in love no 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 you're complete in Him because you trust Christ as your Savior. You're not complete in Him because you figured out a good way to live, even after you trusted Christ. You're complete in Him the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. Why? He makes all things right. So then what difference does it make about how we live? Well, well, well. Shall we really go back and revisit the reward system that the Lord has laid out for people who are saved? Shall we really look at what the Lord called us to be and do? Or why don't we just go to Romans chapter 8 and let Romans chapter 8 settle it? In Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good... To them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I want you to think about the saved individual. Here's the day an individual gets saved. Here's the day he goes to be with the Lord. He stands at the judgment seat of Christ. And he receives from the judge... He receives the reward of his inheritance. The inheritance that he got because he trusted Christ as Savior has a reward attached to it if. And that has to do with everything you do in your flesh from the time you're saved until the time you go. So all along this way, he gets right on up there where he just looks nearly glorious. You can almost see glory from where this dude is at. He's done everything so well. And the next thing you know, Trouble occurs. He marries the wrong woman. He gets twisted by his brother-in-law, the Mormon. He gets turned sideways by interest in other things. And his glory has begun to fade. And he catches himself here. And he comes right back up to this same glory that he was uh, close to before. And then he gets old and decrepit. And he doesn't like it. And his flesh takes over. 
But then he sees, Lord, I repent. And he dies somewhere above where he was when he got saved, but not near to the glory that he used to have. Notice. The call of God upon the life of the saved individuals from predestination standpoint. When this comes about, image of Christ belongs to us that we might be conformed to the image of God's Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So what did the reward system do? Well, it could have been glorious. It could have even after he made a few mistakes been glorious. It could have even after a long life been glorious. The problem in our example is that he didn't obey Philippians 3. Turn to Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, Paul sitting in jail, preached for 33 years or so. Now he's sitting in jail. He writes these words, verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, that would be as in verse 12, apprehended for that which Christ apprehended him. But this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. There is one mark and one high calling, but there's a prize for every person who is saved. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Sometime later, maybe as much as two or three years later, He was in jail again, prison again, and he was fixing to die. And he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. What do you think? If you come down to the end of your road and you see few breaths left, Are you going to be able to say that? He said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Many saved people pass away, knowing they're going to go be with the Lord, but fearing the appearing. Think about that. It's not about being convicted to go to work for the Lord. It's about wanting to. So, yep. There is an if. To be presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. There is an if. And it's there all the time. It's there all the way through Romans through Philemon. The seal of the Holy Spirit and salvation by grace through faith is an altogether different thing than the if. It's an altogether different thing. I don't know if that helps or hinders, Sean, uh, what I mean. Anybody else got any comments or questions about it? Good question, Sean. Very good. Anybody in here got anything they want to add? Is Sean still on there? Yeah, I think so. Say hey from Bill. Bill says... Hey, Sean. He uh, wishes you were here, I think. You know, you're not here, but you are here. Bill says, hey. Bill in New Braunfels. Okay. I hope that helps. Well, all right, it's 827. Anybody else got a question?
Questions going once, questions going twice. <laughs> I appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. Glad you're here. Uh, uh, pretty good sized number of you. Uh, don't see Matt and Mary. So, uh, hey, Mary Danovich, how are you? Thank you. Um, appreciate you being on here. And uh, Austin was indeed represented by one or two. Thank you, Pamela. So glad you're here. Jerry and Company. Now that's it. That's it. Interesting. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye